the rest of the, well, we're, we're going till 3, I guess, or we have until 3. I don't have to go that long, but I have to do early. Okay. okay. I've got about a half an hour of slides. <clears throat> then we can go over and we, I can talk about all the little mixtures of char there for another 15 minutes, maybe. And then we can go up and, um, you know, I don't know what you all want to do with that char. Do you want to get some of I think out? everybody should scoop some up and put yeah. it in a bag and all. I'll right. take as much as you take want. Take it home. No, you can't have it all. I think everybody should go home go with, and have with a it. fight. <laughs> yeah. We'll all emerge. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I have all those pellet bags, so. Thank you. you can take, some take, take it as inspiration to make more. Yeah. <laughs> and I also want to say if, if, the, if anybody's leaves this workshop unsatisfied and you want more, I'm doing a, a full day intensive in Tequilma um, on April 4th at the Spiral Living Center. So you, the sign up for that is on backyardbiochar.net. And things that I'm going to cover there that I didn't cover here is uh, we're going to look, look at the gas fire stoves, how, how to make one and how to use one. And I'll go a lot more into probably composts and mixtures of biochar and also Post, other post-treatment methods like how to crush it and things like that. So if you if you want more, there's more available. <laughs> so are you going to talk about crushing here today? Oh, I might mention it. I mean, because I don't even understand why you'd want to do that. Um, well, we could talk about when we go up there. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is where we left off um, before we jumped into the energy part of this. And I think after we've done some of the discussions we've had about cation exchange and stuff like that, now you probably have a better understanding of, of why someone would make this statement about carbon. So um, I want to talk about now biochar and climate. And this is, in addition to the wonderful things it does for soils, this is the main motivation for me to be involved in this and to be, you know, to have made it my career, actually, not just a hobby, but trying to make it my career to promote this. And here's a quote from, from Bill McKibben, who kind of glommed onto biochar early on. Um, he hasn't been saying a lot about biochar since this quote, which was probably five or six years ago, um, because he's more concerned with stopping emissions. So in, in dealing with climate change and climate solutions, there's two approaches. I firmly believe we need to take both. One is reducing emissions, and the other one is sequestration putting carbon back in soil. Um, they're both necessary. And so here's what he's saying, you know, you, and this is the potential that's gotten so many people, especially in the scientific community, very excited about biochar. Actually realizing that potential is a whole other matter at the scale that it needs to happen. But the potential is there, you know, we can put it back and, you know, for some of us who've been involved in environmental stuff, and especially forest stuff for a very long time, Barry, do you remember standing on the side of the road and seeing a one log load going by and screaming, put it back, right? You know, when we'd see those giant old old trees going down the road, it's like, oh yeah, they, you, could, you would see those. And you know, it was always like, put it back, but you couldn't. But in, when it comes to um, carbon and soil though, we can, and actually maybe somewhat quickly. Um, so. Here's the reason why biochar, it's so important to put biochar in soil, and that is because it is stable. As I talked to you about, the, the aromatic rings are very stable. Microbes really can't eat them. Over time, biochar can get weathered you know, or oxidized, and little flakes of it come off. So over a long period of time, they can't, you know, they can, it can eventually be degraded, but in, in in many cases, it, that's like thousands and thousands and thousands of years. That's why they use charcoal for carbon dating of ancient archaeological sites. So somebody made a campfire 30,000 years ago. That charcoal's still there. They dig it up and they can date it. You know, there's a reason it's still there. Microbes don't eat the stuff. However, um, you know, as we talked about, the charcoal is always going to have some percentage of volatile matter. So when you initially add it to soil, it will break down a little bit. And I just want to show you this. Okay, here's what here's what happens with the biomass. It's 100%, all the carbon's in the biomass. Then you do pyrolysis, okay? Half the carbon leaves as the gas. 
but half of it's left in the charcoal. And then um, in the first couple of years, you lose a little bit of carbon because that's the volatile carbon and that gets eaten up. But then for the next thousand years, <laughs> well, the next five years, and maybe the next thousand, maybe the next 30,000 years, it's pretty much the same. And, oh, there have been a lot of questions about this, whether it's really true, and it, you know, it is. Um, but, so that's why, by comparison, you know, what happens to uncharred organic matter? Um, because it also takes time to break down. But there's like a range of, in this kind of range, you know, if it's, if it's a thick piece of wood, it's going to take, you know, 5, 10, 20, maybe 100 years to fully break down. Um, if it's a piece of straw, it's going to break down fully in a year, you know. And, of course, that also depends where you are. If you're in the tropics, it's going to break down like that. If you're up in the um, boreal forests, you know, it's going to go into a peat bog maybe and take a very long time to break down. But that's just like orders of magnitude, biotrophs orders of magnitude longer lasting in the soil. So here's another look at what happens. So here's the regular carbon cycle. So every, every year the biosphere cycles something like, uh, I forget the numbers, but it's a huge amount of carbon, far more. I mean, if, if the bio, I think it's like 80 tons or something like that. It's beyond gigatons. It's a huge amount. The number is something around 80. And maybe it's just gigatons. Um, so that's the biosphere as a whole. And humans are, are increasing that by a few percents. But it's enough to make the difference with greenhouse gases. So there's a huge amount of carbon cycling every year through our, bio, through our um, biological systems. And here again, it's what happens when you do pyrolysis, half the carbon goes to biochar, and the other half is released as gas or oil. And if you use that for energy, then you get another hit because you're, sub you're, you're substituting energy, uh, biomass energy for fossil energy, and then you, you know, that's another, um, another benefit another climate benefit. So but that's commercially done, right? We, as yeah, as homeowners, that. yeah. Yeah. you know, it's, that's that's untouchable for us at this stage to turn you know, the well, gases into... You know, I mean, people are... are you, the, the example of a greenhouse was raised here. If you had a greenhouse or a, um, you know, or something you're heating with propane and you could substitute <coughs> a, a biochar unit, a little biochar furnace for that, you, it could be within your power. That's great to hear. Yeah, yeah. There's even a vehicle oh. that can run on, you know, on this process. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. A wood, a wood burning biochar vehicle, energy. and it creates yeah, biochar, and it also mm -hmm. uses the the byproduct part of it, the energy part of it, there to power the vehicle. It's possible. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's finicky. You know, it's. Um, but I mean, the possibility is definitely there. So as I said, you know, we can put the carbon back in soil. And this guy, uh, Ratan Lal, is one of the scientists who's really studied soil carbon. And he's saying, if you, if, and he's not even talking about biochar. He's just talking about putting carbon in soil, restoring the carbon that's been lost from soil, essentially, and then growing more plants, trees, grass, mm -hmm. any kind of plants. Growing more plants could draw down about 50 parts per million of atmospheric <coughs> CO2 by 2100. So we're now 50 parts per million over. We should, you know, we should be below 350, but 350 seems like a safe number. We're now at 400, and we're going up. Whoa. So we need to stop emissions, but we also need to draw it down, because 400 is obviously not safe. You know, we're losing our polar ice caps, mm -hmm. we have drought, you know. Uh, I, I don't think I, pro hopefully I don't need to convince anybody here climate, climate change is, is a problem. Yeah, yeah I understand by scientists are saying, you know, 20, 25, 20, 30, 20, 50, our carbon load is, it's really melting everything off. It's irreversible is what I it's heard. It's probably irreversible at this point in the near term. But anything we can do to moderate it, it's know, still beneficial. Yeah. It's still going to be, I mean, we're talking about survival here, so. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, and this is the kind of message I really want 
kids to hear. Mm -hmm. No. Um, back in the in the 30s, there was in the during the depression, there was something called the Civilian Conservation Corps. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I read about it in school. Why don't we have a carbon conservation corps to go out there and make all this biochar and mm -hmm. grow all these trees? Um, but you know, so here's the problem. Also, it's another part of the, another aspect of this is that the carbon in our atmosphere is not just from fossil fuels. A huge amount of it is actually from our soils. It's from agriculture, and in fact, it's been going on for a long time. So ever since rice cultivation. You know, 10,000 years, we have been slowly adding carbon to the atmosphere from agriculture. Of course, you know, Why? industrial... What, what's that? From, from burning? Well, from burning, from deforestation, okay. from um, tillage, yeah. really? oh. from rice cultivation, which releases methane. Oh, yeah. And in fact, this is really interesting, but during the Black Death, you know, the plague years in the Middle Ages, with wiped out half the European population. Mm -hmm. Just after that, the forest grew back all over Europe, taking over the agricultural fields, mm -hmm. and the planet cooled so much that, that um, they had something that they called the Little Ice Age. Mm -hmm. And there are people who think that it's directly related to the reforestation. So there's, it's actually really powerful, mm -hmm. you know, that there's a lot of room for increasing that soil carbon pool. So if most of our agricultural soils have lost half their carbon, uh, we need to put it back for a number of reasons. So here's some, um, here's what happens, Janice. This is what happens, is tilling soil exposes it to air, and adding nitrogen increases the rest, the, you know, the bacterial respiration rate. Oh, so yeah. those bacteria, they're happy with nitrogen, they got oxygen, they're just, you know, going to town and multiplying like crazy and they're burning up because they use carbon in their metabolism they end up burning up the labile carbon in the soil so the compost and the decomposing carbon mm -hmm. it all just decomposes faster and you end up with soils that might have been five percent carbon now being two percent carbon mm. and those soils now have less capacity for storing nutrients they have less capacity for supporting the soil food web they're poorer soils overall um, so this, you know, this shows all different kinds of uh, emissions from agriculture. Here's the rice emitting methane on oh, rice paddies. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a huge source of methane. Huh. And here's the soil respiring emitting CO2. And here's the, you know, soil carbon, but it's getting lost here is CO2 uh -huh. when you till. And when you have bare soil, nothing growing on it, you're, you're emitting CO2. So, you know, and this is a global problem, and, um, you know, it's everywhere, especially, you know, look at China. I mean, they've got 20% of the world's population and about 10% of the world's farmland, and it's in bad shape. You know, here are those beautiful prairie soils. You know, they were talking about how they store so much carbon. Well, we plowed the heck out of them. Um, so, there's a really long the, not the Mediterranean, above the Mediterranean, <gasps> on the, of, of that? north of the Black Sea and south of the Black Sea. Why is that so bad? <gasps> just agriculture, mm -hmm. just, just you know, growing wheat, wheat, whatever they grow there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Australia is not too bad, but Australia was pretty just bad to begin with <laughs> in terms of soils. Oh, right. <laughs> So this is a really geeky diagram, but this is from one of the real seminal papers about biochar potential for carbon sequestration and climate impact. And what this shows is what happens is like a, a whole like flow chart showing what happens to CO2. Okay, it's removed by photosynthesis from the atmosphere. So plants grow, they pull in carbon dioxide through their tissue through their leaves and they use it to build their tissues. That's the carbon. In the, in, the, in the wood. Um, so there are little machines that, that remove carbon from the atmosphere. And then, so here's, here are the kinds of inputs to the pyrolysis process that are appropriate. So agriculture residues, um, you know, forestry residues, manures, all these kind of things that we think of as waste, which can be composted. 
And that's great. And a lot of this stuff should be composted because you need compost as well as char. But if you char it, you get a little bit of an additional benefit because first of all, you might get some energy out of it. And if you, if you substitute that energy for fossil fuel energy, you have avoided fossil CO2 emissions. You're still putting some CO2 emissions back because that's unavoidable. Um, another benefit you get from pyrolyzing it is you get avoided biomass decay. So that's just the natural process of rotting out there in the woods. It's natural, but you know it does contribute to CO2. Hmm. And then you get biochar as a soil amendment, which stores soil right in, in source carbon right in the soil. And here's the, the, the kicker is this little feedback loop here. Okay, that says enhanced primary productivity. And what that's referring to is the little boost you get from adding biochar to soils, you might get more plant growth. And even if it's just a fraction of a percent more, if you keep doing that, you've created a, a pump, a carbon pump, that can pump carbon back into the soil and out of the atmosphere. So that's one reason why a lot of people are real excited about biochar. So here's a real extreme example of loss of soil and soil carbon, and one example of where a number of people are starting to use biochar to restore like a degraded, like a mining site. You know, so no vegetation for a hundred years on this. And they add biochar and in one year, they've got vegetation again. Wow. And yeah, and a lot of that is because of the water holding capacity of charcoal. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of it because nothing's going to germinate if it's dry. No. So then does the biochar do something to the heavy metals? I forget. Yeah, it'll hold on to those too. Oh, yeah. It'll immobilize them. Oh, yeah. So they'll stay out of the water shed, water table. Mm -hmm. and How heavy would they apply that onto a situation like that? You know, they mixed this. It wasn't just biochar. There was compost mixed in, too. Oh. Um, and I don't know exactly. I would say they probably had a couple of inches of, of that. So then you said you didn't have to really rake it in or mix it in. You just kind of put it on yeah. top? I don't know what they did there oh. in that particular. If it had compost with it, you wouldn't really need to mix it too much in the soil. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now let's try. And I'll talk just a little bit about what uh, it does in soil. Earthworms seem to like it. Okay. So here's a list of the benefits. Of course, it'll increase soil carbon levels. It'll improve fertilizer use efficiency. So you know, keeps your nitrogen fertilizers from leaching out. You know, normally nitrates leach really easily into water tables. That's why you get all this water pollution from nitrates. Mm -hmm. um, it'll decrease the toxicity of metals by binding them and immobilizing them, keeping them out of the, out of the food chain. It'll increase the water holding capacity of the soil. And it does that by a number of ways, actually. And this is where you get into particle size, which is kind of important, because if you have a really fine biochar powder, and you add a lot of it to soil, it will actually wick water out of the soil and dry it. So that's just a little caution. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Too much. Too much. Yeah. You know, you want to hit the sweet spot. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. like rice, grain of rice size mm -hmm. particles is really good for water retention. Uh -huh. so, hmm. so I missed that part of how you... This is a different subject, how you grind it up. We'll talk about that later. You didn't miss it. Okay. <laughs> so what else it does? It improves soil conditions for all kinds of life forms. And it moderates soil pH. We'll talk a little bit more about pH later, but um, you know it's a real important issue. And then it just makes your soil loose and fluffy. Uh -huh. So it aerates. It holds water and air at the same time. So it's good for a clay type of soil. Yeah, it's good uh, for clay and it's good for sand. Yeah, right, that's the right. cool thing about it. So we talked we talked about this a lot of, uh, while we were burning that the soils in Iowa have this natural biochar because of the frequent grass fires. So um, you can see you can see the black soil there. That's mm -hmm. uh, a soil pro profile in Iowa. Natural biochar. Um, so in 2012, which was a drought year in the Midwest, um, the soils in Iowa actually did better than other soils in other parts of the Corn Belt that didn't have as much 
natural biochar. Um, and here Iowa State did these test plots where they added additional biochar and they found 15% better water retention. <laughs> That's really significant. Yeah, I do. And especially, you know, when you're looking at what's happening in California and now probably here too, you know, facing mm -hmm. perpetual drought. We have to really, really be careful. So this is what, what it does in the tropics. And um, I actually got to visit Manaus and see one of these Terra Preta sites a few years ago. And you can see, I think you can see that the top part of this profile is pretty dark. That's the native soil underneath. It's a highly leached, what they call an oxisol, uh, iron rich. It also has, it's also kind of acid and has aluminum in it. And aluminum is toxic. Mm. Under acidic conditions, plants can take it in and it's toxic. Is, so that's is that what, naturally occurring? That's yeah. naturally occurring. Oh, yeah. And it doesn't seem to bother trees too much. But for something like corn, you know, that's corn grown on a native Amazonian soil. It doesn't look too good. And that's, you know, why originally anthropologists who first looked, studied the Amazonian Indians said, oh, they're hunter-gatherers. They never had agriculture. How could they? Mm -hmm. Nothing will grow. This is the rainforest. You can't grow anything. Mm. And it wasn't until later, you know, that they realized, oh, there were these areas of really rich black soil. Mm. And that's this stuff. And it could grow corn like that. Mm. And these were human created. Humans created these over thousands of years. Wow. Now, originally, they might not have created them deliberately. Mm -hmm. It might have been an accident because the way settlements go in the Amazon, people live on the high river bluffs year round. The rest of the forest is flooded half the year. Mm. So, you know, they have, they might, you know, they might be moving around it's during the, during parts of the year, but they spend a lot of the year in one place, at least some of the cultures there. And on those high river bluffs where it never floods, that's where you find the terra preta. Because they were living there, and they were living close, you know, kind of dense populations. They were living off of fish from the rivers. And they eventually realized that um, their char whether it was charcoal from their cooking fires, they just, you know, clean out the cooking fire, you know, throw in the fish bones from dinner, right. oh, go poop over there. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe they had urns because they find a lot of um, pottery in these things. Uh -huh. Maybe they had urns that were their poop buckets, you know? And they, and they put charcoal in them to reduce the smell. Mm -hmm. We don't really know. But they ended up with all this really rich soil that had not only charcoal, but also a lot of nutrient in it. So. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, if it was just a, you know, well, that's the garbage dump and wild growth, things go really good there. Eventually, probably they figured out that we can deliberately create these soils because they're, they're massive in extent. Hmm. So, uh, consistently, you know, when you add charcoal to soil, like if you have a beautiful garden bed that's full of compost and, you know, lots of carbon and manure, and you put charcoal in it, you won't notice a big difference around here. You won't. Um, but in the tropics, with those really poor soils, it could be dramatic. So these are, you know, the difference between uh, corn roots in biochar and not in, in Africa. So here's a few pictures from some plant trials, and this is um, these are beans, and these are grown in Hawaii, which probably has um, some of those poor soils tropical soils, highly leached, and, and that's a pretty dramatic difference. But these are pine seedlings just grown in a regular nursery mix, um, and the biochar ones look better. Mm -hmm. So the pine seedlings evidently like a little biochar. Um, and here it is, you know, a lot of people are looking at um, growing media, and what we put in growing media, potting soil, is peat, Vermiculite, all these things are essentially mined, mm -hmm. you know, because peat doesn't really come back very quickly. Vermiculite is a mined <coughs> product, so um, they environmentally have a pretty heavy footprint. So could biochar substitute for peat or vermiculite? And, and it can. You know, the, the biochar one did better than the peat. Do you know what kind of uh, percentage of biochar they were? I don't know this particular one, no. Okay. Well, that goes to my question. For example, if I have, if you visualize a garden 
raised bed of wood, 10 feet long, 4 feet wide, 2 feet high with soil. Do I put in one cup of biochar we'll dust? Get to that. We'll, we'll get good. to that. Thank you. Right so these pictures just show the affinity that, that roots have for biochar. So a lot of times what's happening is there's nutrients and there's um, microbial helpers, you know, mycorrhizal fungi or um, the mycobacterias are living in the char and the roots go in there at, after what they're producing. And, um, and a lot of, you know, traditionally people always put charcoal in the bottom of their potted plants. Hmm. For drainage. For drainage, but also just, they would say it's to sweeten the soil. So it can get really dank in the bottom of a potted plant. Mm -hmm. And the charcoal will kind of keep it more, more air in there. Cool. So for instance, I have a Christmas cactus at home. <coughs> You know, when I had it, it was in a pot about this big, and it would, the plant was about this big, and it always looked kind of pathetic, and it would get a couple flowers around Christmas every year. I repotted it in just a slightly bigger pot with a fair amount of biochar, and it's been in there about five years now, and it's like this. And it, it's now the multi-purpose holiday cactus. It blooms Halloween. <laughs> It blooms Christmas. Thanks. It bloom, bloom. I mean, it's blooming. It has one. Its first bloom is probably the biggest, but it's blooming right now. Wow, it's, cool. You know, it's always got. I've never seen that before. So, do you mix the biochar in with the soil, or do you put it in the bottom, like you were saying? I think that one I just mixed it through. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, um, for container plants, I think biochar is a really good thing. Cool. And here's just some pictures from a scientific paper about um, the habitat value of the char, which some people say, oh, it's like a condo for microorganisms because it's got all these little holes and little pores and, and some things can live in there and be free, safe from predators and um, other things just, you know, people say microbes like to sit down when they eat. You know, they don't, they're, otherwise they're just free floating. That's why they go in colonies, that's why they make films, like the film they make on your teeth, the plaque, you know, so um, this becomes, you know, it becomes a substrate for the microbes. And then the other thing is, if you, if you pick up a copy of that article or read it online, um, there's a whole electrical phenomenon that's going on with biochar, because those fused aromatic carbon rings hold a charge. And that's very complex, I'm not going to get into it. Do you have a, a, link, a link to that article? Um, I'll, yeah, just go to biochar-journal.org. Okay. So, anyway, here's a picture of fungal hyphae penetrating a biochar particle. Here are some little tiny pictures of little tiny bacteria there just sitting on the surfaces of biochar. Um, and here's two examples of char from a forest fire. Okay, so here you go. Here's the answer, Claudia, that you've been looking for. <laughs> This is just the simplest way, and it kind of goes for any, just about any use you can think of. First of all, you must, step number one, pre-treat it. Add it to compost as close to the beginning of the compost cycle as you can, or soak it in liquid fertilizer like urine or manure tea. I don't know if compost tea will really do much without... I, I hear people talking about soaking it in, in air, actively aerated compost tea. But I'm not, I just don't really know if that's effective or not. I haven't really tried it. So I'm kind of be pulling everything out of the tea, putting it in the char. I don't, I'm just, you know, I guess I'm not convinced that actively aerated compost tea is that big of a deal. <laughs> you know, I think it's got, it can, it, everything dies really quickly and, you know. You have to have nutrient and microbes. And, um, the, the bio... Bio, Bokashi. Bokashi. Yeah. It's full of live microbes and bacteria. Yeah, and, and I. And what is it? Um, probiotics or anything? Right, right. Yeah. You know, to some extent, all that stuff should be in your soil already or in your compost pile already. I think, you know, there are really degraded soils out there that probably need some addition. And I think, I, and I think the Bokashi is good. I'm just, uh, you know, the actively aerated compost tea, it, it could be anything, depending on how you make it. So, 
I use a lot of worm castings. Actually, what I do is a lot of my char, I have a giant worm bin. It's one of those, it's called a worm wigwam, and it's got a crank that it's a flow through worm bin. So you crank it, and this rake comes across the bottom of them, and the castings go down into a pan. They fill that pan with charcoal, and the castings fall right on the charcoal. So, um, and then I, I just dry it in the greenhouse, put it in trays.